see from the first picture. This is uh, the Greater Manchester Project, was and is being run 2012 to 2016, where learning difficulty participants, um, actually with their OTs, with hospital advice and so on, planned and prepared and have done excavations. So they've published some work on what they've done so far anyway. And here we have somebody who's Down syndrome enabled archaeology volunteer and he's doing the planning and drawing of one of the contexts. Unusual, but is it? Okay. Um, ooh, yeah. Is it done, right? Yeah, right. Right. Last year's session, I, I, the response was overwhelming. Um, uh, I've been on radio interviews and so on. I reached audiences of 3.3 million. Um, one post in Archaeology for All, my Facebook page, that I write once a week, 500 words or whatever, has reached 70,000 people in one week. My average is 10,000 a week. The, um, and the response was amazing. Um, cultural art, this is what I'm going to do over the session, my 20 minutes or so. Um, recap on last year's session and the events since. The cultural archaeological changes we can make, whether it's blind archaeologists drawing, um, but also the all-in-one awareness that's needed. How do we behave or not behave around disabled people like myself? Or should we say enabled? Um, how can we sustain and attract people? Um, and about the fear, the research I found in my MA dissertation on with dyslexia lecturers and staff and students um, that's employed in the culture of archaeology within the universities, also lecturers in their university life. Um, I will briefly mention museums. Also, perspectives that we all have. You know, for instance, you see somebody in a wheelchair and you'll say, poor thing. Uh -uh. It's totally different for a wheelchair user or a person with a cane. Oh, whoops. Right. Um, I will talk about the freelance enabled archaeologists who are working but are not on the radar when it comes to uh, the 1.98% that are working and also the future. Right. Yes, as I said, EAF have been set up now. That's I didn't go into all, sorry. So that's the end of May. In June to September, the Enabled Archaeology Group, which has 91 members from at least 10 different countries so far, we haven't been set up for a year. We go through the issues, whether disabled or not, it doesn't matter. You can join the group, it's quite closed, but issues that people find, which I'll, I will ask you a question at the end of my session, which I've been asked by Enabled Archaeologists to ask you. It turns, it turns everything on its head. Um, yes, so that's May. In December, there will be an office which will also be a, a drop-in. Uh, again, only two days a week, but uh, finances, we have leads for finances for the first three to five years. And then after that, the firm income ideas either takes over or I become a charity, or we, not I, I apologize, become a charity uh, if the firm income idea turns out to be squat, basically. Okay, it's been delayed. Also, did a lot of enabled archeologists are finding, I'm finding this too, that you can have all the qualifications, experience and skills, um, you know, have a distinction at MA and so on, but people are finding that to get onto PhD is very hard. So um, apparently from America, I found out about you can publish your um, own PhD but by the publications you've written. Now this is in other disciplines and so on, but it can be done and all you need is a supervisor for a short time to go through what's already been published. Obviously you've got to write some stuff, but it's another way that people, not just in a, anybody, can earn a PhD. Um, last year I spoke about Fraser, her um, universal design ideas to be incorporated before we even get to the stage of an excavation. For instance, when you're planning an excavation, finding the area and so on, just to keep in mind that you know all different groups join in on community and public, and also maybe for commercial, 
If you, um, yeah, I've got the 3.3 million people audience, as I said before. Also, for the first time, the positives at this moment, I've been absolutely staggered. Um, there's many, many publications that come out, are coming out, uh, which, such as, you know, books on mental health participants, um, and not just um, unpaid, we're talking about paid commercial units and so on. Um, but we're starting to get recognised as our own group within archaeology. Um, CIFA is now recognised in able archaeology as a discipline, sub-discipline. They've also, this is a professional body obviously, they've also recognised, um, yes, that for instance this year they've recognised 2017 as a year for disability, um, especially majoring on mental health issues. Um, and at last, in, not just in publications, but in radio broadcasts, for instance, I was on UCB1. I've been twice on UCB1 in October and July last year. Communication with all national and international bodies, I said about, I've just started, and I've only just started finding contacts and so on. And 80% of, of the people employed, and it is through positive discrimination within the Act, Disability Act, um, will be employed within EAF especially when the income ideas come in, firm income. Um, and it's essential that we liaise with each other, all of us, not just national, but international and European. And I'm finding a massive, massive response from 18 to 25 year olds throughout the world. There are 30 plus countries that view um, archaeology for all. I've had people from Yemen through to Saudi Arabia through to, but the majority are from developing countries and they're using my work now because it costs nothing. For instance, my idea about blind archaeologists being able to draw, um, record, context and so on, which I pinched from other disciplines because I was taught to do that. <laughs> Physics and geography, they've done it for many years. They've mapped, they've done whatever. Um, that costs less than a fiver for one person. And that can be done even professionally, believe it or not. Huh. Right, very sadly, and if I cry, forgive me, but it's not very professional. One of my participants in 2014 had autism, um, mild, with other mental health problems. He graduated um, and gained a first in his degree. A month after last year's conference, he committed suicide because he suddenly realized how he'd been treated in 2013 on the excavations by the director and others. Uh, a 25 year old that should be here and isn't. I wanted to mention in passing, because I feel so strongly about it, within our own LGBT community, um, when I was getting, starting to get better, because I won't be fully better since September, in February I came out of hospital and I was told about people being hospitalised, being beaten up to a pulp because they're gay within archaeology, archaeologists doing it to archaeologists. People ask me, well, why can't you tell us names? Why can't you tell us universities? Well, I've spoken out about one now because lecturers have now spoken out. There are nine UK universities that are still pretending they have excellent inclusion policies, they do, but their practice is utterly appalling, as I found in my MA research on dyslexia. Okay, next one. I must make sure. Is that gone? Yeah. Okay. Do archaeological cultural changes. Within my MA research, I found that going back to the year 2000, right up to today, there have been many, many, we're looking at hundreds, not just one or two, surveys, placements, uh, trainee teachers, and so on that people who have never experienced anybody with a disability and, for instance, employers in 2005, Phillips and Gilchrist, stated that employers were wary, suspicious, fearful of employing anybody with any disability because they didn't know what to expect, they didn't know if they'd be competent and so on. Well, these surveys have proved that if one person who's not familiar with any disability whatsoever, whether that be dyslexia, somebody who's paraplegic, doesn't matter, whatever it is, if they become familiar with one person and they're chatting away, you know, I don't know even about the weather, whatever, then 
totally after 12 weeks, certainly within one survey especially, their whole attitude changes towards all disabilities. So that's why I encourage very strongly if people want to, not that they have to, um, open up about their own disabilities, that they are enabled. Um, so I suggest that we could culturally change our own cu archaeological culture within universities and within all areas of archaeology by just getting to know one disabled person, suggesting somebody to somebody else who may have a mental health problem working in a museum, say, and saying, hi, this is, an this is Katie, an enabled archaeologist. It's not saying, I've got a mental health problem. It's saying, yes, I'm disabled, but it doesn't affect my job, it doesn't affect me. And hopefully it'll be seen in a good light. Within my um, studies as well, I also research, I also found that we, there are two models of disability that are major within archaeology. One is the medical model where it's the illness's fault and it has to be changed to be come completely ideal, be normal, whatever that may mean, um, of society and our archaeological culture, or its social model, which basically blames society and the buildings not having access, the acceptance of people. Right. The facts show that um, within the universities I've researched and so on, that in, in the best ones, very slowly through disability services, which, by the way, may be actually shut down due to lack of funding and so on, which would be appalling for us all, um, that gradually some of these people are actually taking on the social model and it's actually changing very, very slowly, but it's gradually changing the medical model of culture where everybody has to fit in with whatever is happening within field work, within day trips, within actual work, such as no, no time allowed for dyslexic students. There are some student universities like that. And it's gradually changing. Within a generation or so, we should be able to say, when I'm either retired or dead and gone, within 25, 30 years, we should have come to acceptance. But hopefully, we can get better than that. And these facts show that by acceptance and welcome and changing negative attitudes, such as there are some lecturers, for instance, again, who don't know disability and think that dyslexia, just dyslexia, we're not even talking about anything more major, if there's anything more major, um, it's just pulling the wool over my eyes and they are trying to, uh, and they refuse to give any extra help, inverted commas, whether that be time in exams or essays or a note taker or whatever, because it's an unfair disadvantage to all the other students. And people are suffering. A lady last year actually had a nervous breakdown, yet again, people are having nervous breakdowns and forced out the archeology span they love. Some are in their 20s doing as a student, they're not just 18, 19 year olds. And also many, many lecturers are being forced out. I'll explain that in a minute. The expectations of the medical model that I explained can be dispelled and by actively, openly talking about the taboo of disability, it can be negated. You can see from the picture here, for instance, this is where I got the 70,000. This is a gentleman that was just using an ordinary manual wheelchair to go up a mountain. People have said a billion times to me it's impossible for anybody who's disabled to go up and do excavating in the mountain region. There's millions of different ways. That's what self-coping strategy is about. By using phrases, universal design ideas, and <coughs> planning, keeping that in mind as we plan our policies, whether or not museum, whatever, in whatever area of archaeology, then we won't be forgotten. And at last, at last, we will be accepted as a minority group and by the way, from what I've researched in the last four years, we're not a minority group. There's quite a lot of us, if you include all disabilities. Cross said about in 1995, when it all started, that this was just a talk. We need to talk. And it's just now that we started. Isn't that amazing? At least it's starting. It's great. 
I, my idea is also of mixed dicks. What do I mean by that? You take staff from commercial, one or two, um, one or two from training dicks, and you have a, it depends on the ratio, it could be changed, 60, 40, whatever, where you've got 60% who do, don't know disability mixed with enabled archaeologists on a, a dig just for a week. They also pulled out because I'm now developing um, two strands where you've got your disability awareness courses, invisible and visible. Yes, there's mental health, first aid and so on, that's great. But we need it archaeologically. We need it for our digs. And these folks will then be trained and understand disability and go back to their own units and actually spread it. Changes of perspectives and opinions and attitudes are needed um, within, right, I will say that. If I say it later on, forgive me. For instance, wheelchair users, whether in museums or anywhere else, um, Paul, Paul loves, oh look, she walks with a cane, she's very slow, isn't that awful for her? That's what people think inside. But the fact is that wheelchair users, just like you use a car or a train or whatever to get to A to B, it's our independence. This is my third leg. For wheelchair users, it is our legs. And getting from A to B, don't feel sorry. Feel energized. We're happy to have it. Um, the surprising number of wheelchair users that actually work in field work commercially has gone up quite considerably. Tiny amount, tiny, tiny amount, granted. Um, but it does happen. Right, I'd better zoom on then. Within our culture, <coughs> oh, sorry, I've got it the wrong way around now you've said that. <laughs> no, 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 that's not. <coughs> Within our culture, um, everything is that we need to be ex within university as anyway. Um, you have to fit in with what they want. Yes, of course, you know, big dresses, etc. But the fact is, why can't we all fit in to what we want? Um, for an example, um, we have lecturers who are terrified. Have I got that? No, I'll keep on going. Um, speaking and encouraging me, open speaking about the taboos of disability, if there are such things, which I don't believe, <laughs> um, will sustain and encourage positive and welcoming ideas. Um, there are many disabled and enabled archaeologists volunteers, and we want to be treated like any other participant. How do you do that? Well, that's where what I've written and published so far and what's coming out of the European Field Schools next year and so on can be explained in more detail. Within a dig, one person designated who already knows the person or doesn't know the person um, gets to know them and their disability will aid others. And when you're, for instance, on a, a commercial dig, not commercial, when you're on a community dig and you think that that disabled person really needs help, I was at a dig a couple of years ago and I was really struggling to get stuff into the wheelbarrow um, and somebody came up and said, why hasn't anybody helped you and did it? That really deflated me. What we want is to struggle. If we want help, we will ask our designated buddy and then um, the actual self-worth and confidence shoots up. People become more capable as well who are enabled disabled archaeologists, uh, volunteers, etc, etc. So please, I know it's very hard, and even nurses have said to me, it's so hard not to help OTs and so on. Don't. If you're asked, yeah. But don't step in because it's taking, what enabled archaeologists are saying is it's taking our life choices away. We decide what we want to do, like you decide what you want to do. Um, right. I've spoken about the mixed training digs and also about the courses that I will run, we will run in enabled archaeology. Um, yes, so I've explained that. That's me doing self coping strategies, which weird way, isn't it? Oh, I can't use the thing. Anyway, it's a weird way to lie for digging, isn't it? Especially in commercial, but guess what? People do, and it doesn't hurt the context, the artifacts. I'm not saying it couldn't, but it could. Okay, another way around is also archaeological awareness training. This is a card, mental health condition card from America. Basically, it's telling you in general what you can do when somebody has 
as, for instance, bipolar folks say, uh, have a blowout, <laughs> they are too pressurized within whatever they're doing. It doesn't happen often, but it does. So that, and it also tells them what to do. So I'm suggesting that for us, this is not within archaeology, by the way, these guidelines, but I will, we will be, I keep saying I, will be doing that. So you can see, in one, it's staff and participant, and all of that is the participant as well. Right? Employers. Right, uh, as I've said about employers, they have perceived issues and they are concerned and negative and so on. What about employers not paying somebody for the first week, but they actually see in the application, wow, they've got PhD, oh yeah, no, they fit it all except for the disability, of course. Why not give somebody one week's tryout? They don't get paid, you lose nothing, and you can also see if they fit in. And in that case, why not have two? So that instead of a 40-hour job, make it a 20-hour job so that people can still earn a living, but you have bring extra um, incentive for archaeological interests. Um, you can employ part-time naval archaeologists. It aids invisible disabilities immensely. Um, they prefer to work 10. We prefer, as I am also have invisible disabilities, we prefer to work 10 to 20 hours, especially when it's mental health because the pressure becomes too much of talking to people or the noise. But if they're allowed to do it their way, they, they have ex we have exceptionally clever um, archaeologists around. There are, as enabled archaeologists, we think outside the box. We already use our own self-coping strategy, as you saw in the photograph before. Oh, creeps. I haven't done it on. Sorry. Right? Sorry about that. And we have different perspectives, which when I ask you the question at the end, you will see. And please, our abilities are vast. I'm not saying we're all perfect and we will be the best for the jobs. I'm not saying that at all. We have to be competent, we have to be qualified, skilled and so on. But you're missing, folks are missing out on so much. Please could you spread the word that we could at least fill half of HS2 jobs, at least with consultants, with people on field work. There are more wheelchair users in the field doing field work commercially than there are um, in mental health people, folks. We also, health and safety and insurance, if you look at Towergate Insurance, Tariq is here downstairs, you can ask him as well, supporting evidence. <laughs> um, yeah, many, many, there are more, and I didn't even know this, but there are many freelance enabled archaeologists, they may or may not say they're, you know, um, disabled or not, um, working as freelance in the field, many, many, who are not, again, included on, um, well, it will be next time, of course, um, for, when is that, 2018, 2020? Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> let's leave it for now. But um, we, we could definitely fill at least half that skills gap. And that's just by sitting there. Right. Whoops. Right, right, right. There's also, with, with lecturers, I was concentrating mainly on dyslexic um, students and staff within universities. There's a culture of fear within universities. Not all. Again, I emphasise not all. Um, where what I found, on, having spoken via email to lecturers, is they are terrified, absolutely terrified. And I was quite surprised at that. Um, of the way they are not accepted within their own faculties. They are terrified to say that they have dyslexia, for instance. That's uh, two of the eight that I, I you know, parlayed with. And also, staff are scared to say anything as well. And that includes museum employees and students within that. So we're also a little tinge of museum coming. What's amazing is the Equality Act 2010 creates an emphasis, they feel, of disability rather than ability, so that when they can, as they can, go to their employer with the 2010 Act and say, I have this disability and this is what I need. They are terrified that they are going to be kicked out, basically, on another pretext. And this also goes for some disabled students. Um, it supports the culture of all participants having to fit in, you know, um, 
you must do this, you must get that, and so on and so forth. Um, as a lot of, as some, no, a minority of archaeologists say, everything should stay the way it's always been. But with self-coping and group strategies, we can take away a lot of those issues. What do I mean? I can't go into it because I haven't got time. Right, but by low cost inclusion and also having the same pace and quality as other participants, we can more than disabled enabled archaeologists can definitely, and I guarantee it, I've seen it time and again, do the same work. I know of one disabled enabled archaeologist who has worked for five years in commercial and they've got this they've got invisible and visible disabilities. I know of at least one, but I also know of another five or six who I can't mention again. Mm. Right, changing perspectives and enabled archaeology and all. Oh, As I... Go back, go back one. Oh. <laughs> no, no, that's no. not. No. 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 The one in the middle. Help me, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't pretend to be technology commander. I know how to press a button for studentship and sending in my MA and things. Right. Or did. Thank you very much. Right. As I've explained, wheels, cars, trains are transport, therefore legs to the users. So don't feel sorry for us. Think how much we could do more because otherwise we'd be trapped. I wouldn't be able to get out at all. Wheelchairs are a boon to us, not, not a thing. And also, what is good behaviour or good practice within invisible <coughs> disabilities? I think I'm going to... How much time? Right. I can't go into it. I'm sorry, I should have... But the miniscule evidence shows that there are more wheelchair users in the field. Um, good practice, best practice. At the end of the day, it's just treating everybody exactly the same. All we want as enabled archaeologists is for you to speak to me, I speak to you. You see if... I'm utter crap at your job, or if I'm excellent, and if I'm excellent, I hope I'm hired, just like anybody else. Um, what we need is awareness, understanding, and knowledge building. And it is starting to affect the foundations, and it's starting very, very minutely, I can't go into it either now, darn it, um, of our university culture, archaeological culture, and our employers' culture too. Right, and now done it wrong, have I? No, I've got it right. No, I haven't. Which button again? Bottom. Bottom. Changing yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, no, it, it down, I've got it upside down. <laughs> no wonder I couldn't do yeah. it. Sorry. Oh, okay. Thank you. It's the last one. I told you. I'm not taking it. It's not my own. Okay. Right. Enabled archaeology and archaeological culture. Everything is changing. Enabled archaeology is being accepted everywhere. Not by everybody. Um, right. People are speaking up me now. There's a vast amount of awareness building. Publications and media are vastly improving. For instance, the 3.3 million on a, on a Tuesday morning listening to what I was saying. The nearly 70,000 who have spoken and shared just from one post. There's a generational change coming. Medical model will be gradually, very gradually, foundationally um, superseded by the social and what is now seen as impossible will be possible. And guess what? We all, all of us in this room are able. Thank you.